If you're an author or plan to be one, get excited because this podcast is for you. Book Marketing Mentors is the only podcast dedicated to helping you successfully market and sell your book. If you're ready for empowering conversations with successful marketing mavens, then grab a coffee or tea and listen in to your host, international best-selling author, Susan Friedman. Welcome to Book Marketing Mentors, the weekly podcast where you learn proven strategies, tools, ideas, and tips from the masters. Every week, I introduce you to a marketing master who will share their expertise to help you market and sell more books. Today, my special guest is a sponsorship expert. Charmaine Hammond is a professional speaker, best-selling, award-winning author of five books, and is featured in eight others. She teaches authors how to make their book a business. From selling books in bulk to doubling book sales at signing and speaking events to finding corporate sponsors for your book events, launches, and tours, she helps authors get their message into the hands of readers around the globe. Charmaine, what an absolute pleasure it is to welcome you to the show. You're an NSA colleague. You're a CSP colleague, for those who don't know, Certified Speaking Professional, National Speakers Association. So welcome to the show and thank you for being this week's guest expert and mentor. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. I'm looking forward to it because I know we're going to learn so much from you from selling books in bulk. I'm just going to stop there because (laughs) that in and of itself, Charmaine, if there's something that my authors and my listeners always say is, how do we sell books in bulk? Mm. So I'm over to you, Madam Expert. (laughs) Well, I love the question. And it's interesting because I learned about selling books in bulk after I got so tired as an author of going to book signings where you might sell eight books or 15 books. And half of them are people that already have your book. (laughs) They just came to support you because they love you and your book. And that's where I thought there's got to be a different way. And the first way I started selling my books in bulk was to offer people at book signings the opportunity to buy five books at a discounted price and they could either donate the other four books in the bundle of five to a favorite charity or a school, some audience that would benefit from your book. And that really helped. I would have people buy five books at a time. And what I did learn is that if you don't make the ask, nobody assumes that you can buy more than one book at a book signing. And that idea then spiraled me into thinking, how else could I collaborate to sell them by the box or the trunk load instead of five at a time? And the real key to this is there's two keys. One of them is that authors who find a charity, a foundation or a nonprofit that they really love and that resonates in some way with your book, you can actually find sponsors, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. You can find sponsors to buy your books in bulk and give to charities or give to their employees. And that's what I do all the time. In fact, I was just speaking at a conference for 300 people recently, and I worked with the organizer to find a sponsor to buy 300 copies of my book so that everyone in the audience was given a book instead of having to buy them. And it's really about collaboration and building relationships that are mutually beneficial. That is dynamite information. First of all, just the idea of selling more than one, because the idea of just selling books in onesies and twosies, I remember my first (laughs) book, the same thing. It's like, I was like, I'm not going to be able to sell anything if I'm just doing it onesies and twosies. So looking for those bulk sales is key. And I have to credit one of my readers for this, because when I was first published, it was in Chicken Soup for the Soul, what I learned from a dog in 2009. It was before my first book came out. And I had a lineup. There were about 70 people that came to that book signing at a chapter store in Canada. And I had people who were coming to buy the book and support me. They were all local people. And one of the people who came up in the line, she said, I'm buying two books. I'm going to give one to our local SPCA. 
And I thought, wow, isn't that a great idea? And then a few moments later, somebody else came up and she said, do you mind if I buy two books? Because I was thinking this would be great in my kid's library at school. And I thought, hmm, these people are giving me great marketing strategies. I couldn't wait for the signing to be over so I could go home and start figuring out how to do this on a bigger level. I love the idea that they're asking you, do you mind if I buy another (laughs) book? (laughs) I know, it was just great to see. And you know, one of the tricks to this, what I later learned was, how do I kind of make this part of a system so that Every time I do a signing, whether it's at, you know, I've seen authors sell books at craft fairs and book fairs and at bookstores, at speaking events, regardless of where the book is being sold, a really great strategy that will guarantee to double your book sales at a signing is to find that charity. And then what I do is called a BOGO, buy one, gift one. And how that worked, and this came from the ideas that these book readers were giving me at that signing, I created a opportunity when I talked about my book and then was at the table to sign my book, I mentioned that we were excited to have this charity. And I picked different charities in the different communities that I was signing in. And I was telling the audience that if they were to buy two books instead of one, they could keep the one book and the second book could go in this basket. And that charity would be taking the basket of books that were donated from these individuals who were at the signing and bought two books. They would take those books and provide them to their clients or the school that they worked for or you know the individuals in their foundation that could benefit from this book. And immediately when we started doing that as part of what we do for every signing, it doubled our book sales. And what I discovered is that people will not buy two books unless you create the opportunity because we don't think in that way, I should buy two books. What that reminds me of is I was recently in Australia and visited a gift store at a school for the air which Mm. is a school where kids who are in very remote parts of Australia learn through, literally, they used to fly the materials out to them because they were really remote. I mean, like Mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of miles from a big city. They asked whether we would like to buy a book for the kids. And inside, we had a little card that you could write a personal message to a student. I thought that was so touching, the idea that I didn't know who this child who would get this book was, but the fact that I just put a little motivational message, inspirational message, you know, keep learning, it's a great thing. Mm. And you saying that for doubling up, That could be another way of doing it. Maybe there's a charity for children who need books or a school that needs books. Charmaine, you mentioned the word sponsorship. Now, that is music to my ears, and I (laughs) want it to be music to our listeners' ears. Talk to us about sponsorship. You're the expert. (laughs) Tell us what we need to be doing because there's gold there. (laughs) There literally is gold there. You are right. You know, sponsorship is often thought of by entrepreneurs, authors, and speakers as something that only applies to a nonprofit or a charity. And that's actually not true. Sponsorship is what we call a marketing relationship. And it's the result of a really good collaboration. There certainly are nonprofit organizations that get sponsorship as part of their fundraising, but we're not talking about it in that concept today. We're talking about what can authors do to build relationships with businesses and tap into their marketing dollars. And when sponsors sponsor me or our clients, for example, as authors, they're looking for a collaboration that helps them with their marketing needs. Because when we look at sponsorship from the author perspective, it's a marketing relationship with a business and we are helping them solve some of their marketing issues. The money that they're giving you is not philanthropy dollars. It's not free money. It's coming from their marketing budget. 
where they could choose to spend money on print advertising or Facebook ads or in the old days, the yellow pages. They could spend money on radio and media and they also spend money on sponsorship. And the exciting news for all of the authors listening is that more and more small businesses are also seeing the value of sponsorship as part of their marketing strategy because it provides so much ROI, return on investment for them. You're thinking, well, how does that work? What can you get sponsored as an author? And the very first sponsor that I had was my eye doctor, my hairstylist, and the clothing store that I used to shop at. And the clothing store provided clothing at no cost. And I'm talking a lot of clothing, fancy wear, casual wear, everything in between wear. And that was all sponsored by the clothing store. And my hairstylist provided me with my hairstyles, my nails, and even massages because they had a spa attached to their business. So I had monthly massages that were sponsored. And then the eye doctor, this was an interesting relationship. I happened to just be talking to my ophthalmologist when I was in for a yearly checkup. And I was telling them that one of my children's books had just won an award. He said, children's books? I didn't even know you were an author. And by now I was on book number four. He said, well, we're trying to get information out to moms and dads and teachers about the importance of eye care for children. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know how I can help them with that. And he said, you know what I think we could do is what if we were to buy several boxes of your books and inside it, we would just slip a really nice little bookmark that had three tips on how we can help children take care of their eyes. And and we will give all of our clients with families your copy of your book, a pair of really cool sunglasses and information to help children. And that's exactly what they did. And then they ended up sponsoring events for us as well. Just that alone, if our listeners would take that information, that was dynamite. I mean, we could finish now and they've already got their money's worth, but we're not (laughs) going to. Let's hear about some of the other examples, maybe some bigger businesses who ordered hundreds, if not thousands Mm -hmm. of copies of books. Do you You have those kind of examples? We do. About four years ago now, we did a really, really exciting project through my company, which was designed to promote a couple of my books. And we called it the Million Acts of Kindness Tour. And it was promoting my children's books and the speaking that I do about building more kindness in workplaces. We ended up having the motorhome sponsored, fully sponsored for seven weeks to take us 10,000 miles across North America. We had a telecommunications company that did all of our sponsorship of technology. Now I'm sharing these two examples, Susan, because in those cases, it was not a cash sponsorship. It was what we call in-kind sponsorship. But the value of it to me was significant because if I had to have rented the motor home that we needed, it was a 32 foot motor home, fully loaded. It would have been probably $10,000. And then that company hosted events for us all along the way, which brought media, helped with book sales. So the value of what they gave us in kind was actually more helpful than it had they have cut us a check for five or $10,000. And the same thing with the telecommunication company, that was an in-kind sponsorship, but they were tweeting out our content about my books, which every time they did a tweet, it reached over a million people. And our following skyrocketed just because of that. And so I looked at what would I have paid in Facebook ads or in Twitter ads to get that increased following. And then there's a really cool sponsorship example. And we've had students that have taken this very model and applied it with their specific book. We worked with the book that I was promoting had to do with my dog, Toby, And one of our partners was Petland Canada, who have, at that time, 25 stores across Canada. And they hosted events, actually tailgate parties, because it was football season. They hosted events in their locations. But the really cool thing that they did was they created a fundraiser in their 25 stores over a period of less than a week. And those fundraisers generated more than $10,000 And Petland Canada 
provided us that money for us to give schools across our tour route my books. So they essentially purchased $10,000 worth of my books. That's very nice. (laughs) And what was so great about it, Susan, is that because of how they set up this fundraiser with the people that came into their store to do the shopping and buy pet supplies, leashes, dog foods, those kind of things, it engaged their customers in what my whole tour and book was about, which was about kindness. And it was incredible to be, I remember sitting at the table where I was signing books and I heard this little guy at this at the till, he was probably 15. And he said, Hey, do you want to give a $2 to the team Toby uh, million acts of kindness tour? And the customer asked, what is that? And he said, Oh, it's the coolest thing ever. This lady wrote a book about her dog and they're going across North America. And this dog is teaching kids about kindness. I was bullied when I was a kid. And it's so cool that a dog can help the world be kinder. And the lady actually gave him $50 towards the project. And, you know, he started doing the happy dance because he had got more donations than any of his colleagues that day in the store. But I was excited because it actually got other people talking about my book and the message. Sign that guy up. He's a salesman. (laughs) I know. I hope he got a good raise after that or employee of the month or something. He was phenomenal. What's going through my mind, Charmaine, is the ideas. Now, are these ideas that you sit down together and come up with? Is this something that the company comes up with, you come up with? How does that happen? That's a fantastic question, Susan, because it's the whole, you know, what do I do? Who do I ask? What do I ask for? All those questions that come up. I'm going to start with answering that question with a common mistake that happens. What authors, entrepreneurs, speakers typically do is they come up with a great idea and then they contact a business that they don't have a relationship with and they have the conversation about, I've got this great idea and you should just be a sponsor and we can do this and this and this for you. And 90% of the times the answer will be a flat out no right then. And the reason is, is because if you think about it, you've never met this person. You have no idea what their business plan is around marketing, and yet you've asked them for money. That's a big mistake. It's asking for something before you have the relationship. So what we teach our students in Raise a Dream is to build the relationship and create it together. The Petland Canada example, I love sharing that example because honestly, Susan, the phone call that I made to them was to ask for a donation of 12 pedometers because we were going to hold a human dog walkathon to see who could do more steps in a period of time and it was going to raise money for a school. We never did get the pedometers, which is a funny story because that relationship building and conversations with Petline Canada turned into this wonderful conversation about what could we do together to make a bigger impact. It went from this idea I had of 12 free pedometers to a tour that they sponsored right across North America and got us into numerous schools and allowed our book to make a difference in families' lives. It's all about relationship and co-creating these ideas together instead of trying to sell somebody something. I'm going to get very basic and say, Mm -hmm. when you go to these companies, which department, who do you work with? The first thing is, this is a really great takeaway, what anyone can do right away is you always start with who you know and where you do business. So there's a tendency for us as authors, we think, oh, my book is about health. I'm going to contact Lululemon, or I'm going to contact this national gym or this national wellness company. The challenge is, is if you don't have a relationship with them, you're at the same place as the hundreds of other people that are calling that company every week asking for something. Your best success will come from who you know, where you shop, and where you spend money. So give you an example. If you look at where you shop, the idea of my ophthalmologist, my eye doctor years ago, that's a great example. My hairstylist, the salon that I shopped at, my local printer. Actually, my first printing sponsor was not a printing company. It was my friend who had a safety company with a really, really awesome 
printing press photocopier and uh, binding machine. He became my printing sponsor for all of my marketing materials. So start with who you know, where you have a relationship with. And what I mean by who you know, it doesn't necessarily mean all of the places where you shop and spend money. It could also be who are you connected to on LinkedIn? You always want to start with connections versus strangers. That will lead you to yes much quicker. And you want to start building in-kind sponsorships because that produces an element of trust and less risk. For example, when I was able to show that I had a printing sponsor, and then I later went to a bigger printing company to establish a larger printing partnership, they saw that I was already working with about 20 different sponsors, including my hairstylist and my clothing store. And what that did, the individual said, wow, this is great, Charmaine, that you're working with all these partners. It really reduces the feeling of risk for us. That stuck out for me, Susan, because I thought, wow, when we don't know them or when we're just starting to build that relationship, there is hesitancy and risk for a company to give you money because they don't know that you're going to deliver on what you said. Start with who you know, where you shop, where you spend money. And then when you take it to the next level, your question, Susan, with a company, who do you look for? What are the departments was your question. I use LinkedIn for this. LinkedIn is your best, best support for finding sponsor contacts. And what you can do is in your LinkedIn, there's that search bar and you can punch into that LinkedIn search bar that the company that you're interested in, let's say it's Canadian Tire or Lululemon or Starbucks or Subaru Cars, whatever the company is, you're going to type the name of the company in there. And then you're going to try it with the word sponsorship. So Subaru sponsorship. And it will come up with people that in their profile in LinkedIn have mentioned Subaru and sponsorship. This is a little bit of a a journey here to do this because it may also bring up nobody. Yet we know that Subaru is a big sponsor of many things. Then you try another search term. Subaru, corporate investment. Subaru, community relations. Subaru community investment. That's a big, important word right now. Many companies call sponsorship community investment. It could also be Subaru corporate responsibility. This will let you know who in that particular company you're searching works in sponsorship. If you can't find it under any of those titles, you can simply punch in brand development or marketing because sponsorship falls under the marketing arm in the company. Absolutely brilliant. (laughs) Listeners, this is such dynamite information. I hope you're going to put some of it to use. As you know, Charmaine, our listeners also love mistakes. You mentioned one. (laughs) What else could you share with us? I've got to (laughs) squeeze the lemon. (laughs) How long do you have, Susan? There is a list within a list within a list of mistakes I've made. And that our students have made it because part of the learning process is making these mistakes that you'll never make again. So I'm going to share the ones that I want you all to completely avoid. The number one is asking without a relationship that we talked about. Take time to learn companies, what's important. Choose companies that seem to be aligned with you where there feels like a fit. Mistake number two, this is so interesting and it will probably knock the socks off people. Many sponsors tell us that authors and entrepreneurs ask for too little. The sponsorship ask is too small where it's simply not worth the time or energy of the company to do the work and what we call activation of that sponsorship. It's really important for all of us to know and believe the value that we bring to a sponsor as an author and as an entrepreneur. One of the other mistakes is not giving the sponsor enough time. This happens a lot. I'm going to use an event, for example. A lot of authors will have events or they will speak at an event and want to have their book given away or sponsored. What often happens is, oh, it's four weeks before the event. I should start finding a sponsor. Unless you know this person very well on a personal level, the majority of sponsors can't pull anything together in four weeks. 
or six weeks, we started approaching sponsors for our Million Acts of Kindness Tour a year in advance. Two of our sponsors took eight months from the very first conversation we had to the time that we signed the contract, eight months. The bigger the sponsorship, the longer it takes is just a really simple rule of thumb. And I think the other mistake that people make, this is a really important one to never make this mistake. And I did it twice. I'm a slow learner, Susan. The mistake is sending out a whole bunch of random proposals and worse yet, proposals that have gold, silver, and bronze levels or tiers, just sending them to people by email or fax. It's the equivalent of the phone calls that we all get in the evening from someone we've never met who, when we answer the phone, basically says they've got the best thing or the best children's sports team and do you want to give us money? That's how it feels for that sponsor receiving that email, a pitch from someone that they never met. And I did that six years ago before I was figuring out how to do sponsorship differently. It was actually probably more than that, maybe eight years ago. I emailed a whole bunch of motorhome companies, a hundred of them to be exact, with this lovely letter and it was really pretty and very good copywriting. And I faxed it to a hundred companies and I got zero response. And two years later, this is the key, when I was starting to look at the Million Acts of Kindness Tour, knowing that we were going to be doing this, when I phoned some of them, remember, there's a two-year gap here. I had some of them who would not get on the phone with me. They remembered that letter. Do not pitch people without a relationship. Don't send generic proposals like the gold, silver, and bronze, because when you do that, it shows that you haven't taken time to understand the company. One of our sponsors, when we brought her in to talk to some of our students, she summed it up beautifully. Deb said, when you send us a pitch or a proposal, you being any of us, when an author, an entrepreneur sends a proposal or a pitch and gold, silver, or bronze type tears, she said, you're asking me to spend my time reviewing your proposal, yet you've taken no time to understand our company. Otherwise, you wouldn't have sent us a generic pitch. And she said, we shred those. (laughs) So you've done all this work to submit these proposals that just get shredded. Stand out by taking the time to get to know the company or the sponsor. And that's why when you start with people you know, you will move through this so much faster. One of the things that you said earlier is understanding charities. And many companies have got a favorite charity. And I think if you tap into that and they may very well be interested to talk to you. Charmaine, I know that our listeners are just like chomping at the bit to find out more. How can (laughs) they find out more about your services? Take it away. Oh, well, they can visit our website, raiseadream.com. And that's the same platform we have on social media, Raise a Dream on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And we share lots of helpful information to help authors. And we have a program called Your Book as a Business. So we work a lot with authors, helping them raise awareness about their book, raise revenue related to their book, and more importantly, get sponsors so that your book can get into the hands of readers and into the ears of readers for audiobooks around the world. And if you were to leave our listeners with a golden nugget... What would that be? As if you haven't already, but you know, I'm like greedy. I want more. Our (laughs) listeners want more. So what would that be? (laughs) I think the golden nugget would be this is even though asking can be uncomfortable for us, it's something that we can practice and be more confident with. Here's what I know is if we don't make the asks, if we don't talk to people that we know and have relationships with and say, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm on a big mission here to get my book into the hands of readers around the world. How could we collaborate together? What could we do together? Where are the synergies? If you don't ask, it's always a no. But what if you were to ask and they said, wow, what a great idea. Let's figure this out together. Imagine what can happen. So my golden nugget would be knowing that the ask does a couple of things. It can lead you to a yes It can help you partner with other people to make a bigger difference in the world. And 
it also shines a light that as you are modeling asking, it makes it okay for other people to do the same thing. Listeners, this has been unbelievable wisdom, Charmaine. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you shared. This has been outstanding. And thank you all for taking time out of your precious day to listen to this interview. And I sincerely hope that it sparked some ideas you can use to sell more books. Here's wishing you much book marketing success. The time is now to take action and finally build your book selling empire. And the great news is that Susan is here to help you. Visit bookmarketingmentors.com and sign up for a free 15-minute book marketing strategy session with Susan. She'll help you discover your first steps to marketing and selling your book. Only those who take action are rewarded. So visit bookmarketingmentors.com and we'll see you again next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.